Okay, I think we'll get started. So today we're going to talk about the atomic orbitals. This is going to be the first of two videos. Uh, here we're going to get used to what the orbitals mean, how to represent those, uh, what the, what, uh, how to represent the orbitals, and then uh, say a little bit about their structure. The next video we're going to get deeper into a systematic way of learning about the of of like n learning about the structure. So um, we'll get a little bit of deeper understanding of the wave functions. Now, as we've said uh, many times, uh, we're not going into the full-blown quantum mechanical solutions. Uh, we're just going to look at what they are and try to interpret them graphically. So we won't get to we won't get deep into the math other than a really uh, simple equation here. Uh, and again, we haven't seen where these come from. Uh, we certainly will do this as we get further up into our physical chemistry curriculum. All right, well, we've learned that for hydrogen, uh, we get a set of wave functions, which we quickly start calling atomic orbitals. These wave functions, as we said, live in a five-dimensional space, three spatial dimensions, so our x, y, z dimensions uh, of this room, and then a separate spin space. So we can cast the wave function in two pieces, what we call the spatial part and the spin part. The spatial part is governed by three quantum numbers, and we expect that because we know that we get a quantum number for every dimension that we quantize. So x, y, z, we get um, three, that's three dimensions, so we expect three quantum numbers, n, l, and m. Then in the spin space, spin is its separate two-dimensional space, so we expect two quantum numbers, s and ms. All right, well, let's fo we're going to just focus in on the spatial part for today. We're not going to worry about spin. Uh, that's because we want to be able to understand what do the wave functions tell us in the three-dimensional space surrounding the nucleus. And um, as we talked about last time, the wave function wave functions represent what's called a probability amplitude upon which when you do something called the modulus square and if you've had some complex function um, courses then you know exactly what that is uh, but if not just think of it you can kind of think of it as a square just if you haven't had any complex numbers uh, just think of it as squaring the function when we do that we get something called the probability distribution which is a real physical thing that we can interpret as here's the chance of finding the electron if this is the nucleus here's my chance of finding the electron here or here or here or here governed by that function since we're in 3D space, it's a function of three variables. Uh, and that causes us a little bit of a problem uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, if we have three independent variables, we don't have any more variables to actually plot the function. So it's hard to visualize these things just for that fact alone. And in general, these functions are complex. And I don't mean complex as complicated, but complex as it involves complex numbers, square root of minus one. So uh, what I do to uh, in my class it, when we first come into this is try to give an analogy of what we're trying to do here in terms of representing the function. So we've run out of dimensions, as I said, to plot the value of the function. So let's pretend, um, you know, we're all familiar with the sine function. We can plot it very easily because it's a function of one independent variable, and then we can use a second dimension. Uh, so for example, the horizontal dimension is x, vertical dimension is y, and we can use that extra dimension to plot the value of the function. And when we do that, we get the very familiar sine shape if we're going from 0 to 2 pi. But let's say, uh, and this is what I, I give my class, is let's say we had to represent that on a one-dimensional sheet of paper. So I give them this white string, and you can't bend the string. It's got to be pulled tight. It's a one-dimensional string. You could also take a, 
just strip of a really thin strip of paper or maybe uh, a, a stick a little a chopstick or something and use that as the one dimensional sheet of paper so now we're in a similar situation here we have one dimension the x dimension and nothing else so we've run out of dimensions for which to represent this function and then i challenge the class to can you draw the sine function on this one dimensional sheet of paper well, uh, they usually come up with some pretty good ideas. And there's several ways we could represent that. Here's what the function is. We need a second dimension to carry that information. And that dimension doesn't need to be spatial. It can be other things. For example, color or grayscale, um, density of dots, uh, or simply um, a little bit more uh, a gross approximation, but simply is the function positive or negative. And these are the ways we're going to end up representing things in three-dimensional space. So let's take this sine function and try to represent it here. Uh, <coughs> we can represent this as uh, either if you think of this as grayscale or you can think of this as a density of dots, although that's <coughs> a little bit harder in 1D. So just think of the, the string as being now gray to white so we can color it all the way to black and white and everything in between and we're going to let the value uh, of the color represent the value of the, the absolute value of the function and so here we see the function is high here it's zero uh, here it's low right now we've lost information about plus and minus here in this representation <laughs> if we have a uh, more than just uh, black and white, we can use color. And so we could uh, use color to represent positive, red, say, purple to represent negative. And then we can see this has a sign change right in the middle at the so called node. So the node is right here. Or we could simply draw, and this is what we'll do primarily draw the position of the node and then writes plus or minus on this. Each of these have their different advantages. And uh, as you look in your general chemistry book, as you look on Google, you'll see lots of different representations of the wave functions that employ these types of things in representing uh, how we understand this. So I would uh, pause for a moment, make sure you can really understand how you might represent some one-dimensional function if you had only a one-dimensional sheet of paper. All right, well, let's look at uh, some of these wave functions. And uh, we'll just look at the very easiest one here, the 1s. Now, 1s means n equals 1. If n equals 1, then l can only be uh, 0. And if L is 0, then M can only be 0. So technically, we would call this the 1S0 spatial wave function. But we, with S's, we're stuck. This is always going to be 0. So we drop this. We don't, in your Gen Kim book, uh, it'll, it'll most likely be 1S rather than 1S0. And this is proportional to a decaying exponential function, e to the minus r. <coughs> And uh, so we can plot this actually as a function of r, right? Uh, it's independent of the angles in space. And so if we think about what is this going to look like in three-dimensional space? Well, it's going to be a evenly distributed probability amplitude that is highest at the nucleus and just decays out in every direction according to an exponential decay. So this is one way to represent that, and this will work for any of the S functions because the S functions do not have, um, do not have angle dependence. But usually we're not, we usually we're, want to talk about S's and P's and D function, uh, wave functions all at once. So this is not something we'll do too often. Another representation then is to take a slice let the sheet of paper be a slice of this 
of this three-dimensional shape that's highest in the middle and decaying out to the edges. And we represent that with a density graph. So either a density of points or a grayscale graph. And so we have highest density here, and then in all directions, uh, it, it decays away. And then we'll have, in our minds, we have to think about that's also happening here in this dimension as well. It's three-dimensional. Another representation, which we'll use, uh, which will be the basis of what we use most often, is we apply some kind of cutoff here. It's a, or a checkpoint or something like that. So let's say this is at 1% of the original height. Then what we do is we draw a we draw the surface, the surface where the wave function is equal to this. And if we think about that, this is going off in all directions exactly the same. So if we choose that cutoff point, that's going to form the surface of a sphere. And so we draw this as a sphere. And then for good measure, we say this is positive over here. It's above zero. So we write plus up in here. Now, this positive is not charged. This is something that's easy to get confused, uh, especially as you start working with this and we get a little further in. Uh, positive is the sign of the wave function. Just like the sine function here can be positive or negative, a wave function can be positive or negative. In this case, the 1s is always positive, but everything beyond that will have some times when it's negative. Okay, well, yes, this is great, but it is hard on paper to always be drawing these three-dimensional structures with the right perspective. So what we do here is something similar to over here. We take a slice through this and then draw that cutoff point. And uh, we again put the plus, the sign of the wave function, not the charge. So how do we interpret this? Well, we put this cutoff at, say, 1% or whatever arbitrary percentage. And what that means is if this were to be squared, uh, so if we just take this and square it, then this line would represent the, would represent this, the, the range over which the vast majority, say 99% of the chance of finding the electron would be. You always could find an electron out here, but it would be a very, very unlikely situation to find an electron out there if you make a measurement. So we make a measurement. Most of our measurements will be inside this sphere. All right, well, let's look at a little bit more complicated one, the 2s. In the 2s case, we have a positive and negative case, and we have a node here, just like we had with the sine function. And nodes, again, will be very important to us. All right, well, how do we use this representation? Well, we draw this outer circle to still represent this cutoff point. And then we draw the node explicitly. So we draw this node, and this, this is a subtle point, but we want to make sure we are very clear on it. This is representing a node, and we see that because the sign of the function changes from one, one sign to another, here positive to negative in this case. The outer circle, the outer circle is not a node. We're still negative up here. We're just at a very low probability of finding the particle. So one of the things we're going to do that's going to be very important to us is counting the number of nodes. And in this case, we would have one node right here, you know, as we cross here, and not a node here. Right? That's not a node because the sign is the same. It doesn't change. That's just representing that outer surface. OK. Now. Remember, the, this, is, this is down at what we call the probability amplitude level. To represent something physical, we're going to have to square this, or actually modulus square, to 
give a probability distribution. And again, if you haven't had any complex analysis, that's okay, um, and you don't know much about complex numbers, just think of this as squaring it, and you'll be fine, at least through, through what we're talking about in these early uh, classes. Okay, so let's, let's think about this, for example. I have a complete freedom of the sign here. I could also write minus, right? Because when we square it, everything's going to be plus. So we have a sign choice, but once we make that sign choice, then we want to stick with that through the whole picture. So this is too simple to kind of illustrate that, but here's an example with the 2s. I could go plus minus, and that's totally fine as well, because if we think about this, when we square this, this is going to be positive, zero is going to get squared, that's the node, that's going to still stay there, and then the negative is going to get squared. So at the square level, these are both positive, at the square level these are both positive, and these would look exactly the same physically. So physically these represent the same wave function, even though their phase is opposite. Okay. All right, so when we get the set of wave functions, uh, they most naturally come out of the solutions of the quantum mechanical problem for hydrogen as what we call the physicist picture. So these are the direct quantum mechanical solutions. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, well, the wave functions are complex, and again, complex doesn't mean complicated necessarily. It means involving complex numbers. Uh, but the advantage here is that all the quantum all the quantum numbers are exactly what we've been talking about. Now, uh, what we will be working with, and what you'll see in your Gen Chem book, and what you know you're all, you'll always work with in chemistry if you go into organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry, and you start working with the atomic orbitals, you'll be using what's called the chemist picture, and. Uh, the advantage of this picture is that, the, is that the wave functions are all real. So once we get into the chemist picture, if you haven't any complex anal analysis, it's irrelevant. Uh, all these are real, and so the mod square is exactly equal to the square, and so you can just think about squaring these wave functions. Uh, the disadvantage is we can no longer label them precisely with, the, with all of the quantum numbers. The n and the l will stay the same. Uh, but these are going to be linear combinations of the physics picture uh, at the m value level. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a, a little bit here. Okay, so uh, this is sort of an overview. Uh, let's go to the doc cam and we'll start looking at these pictures. It's a little bit easier to look at the pictures that are drawn in, in figures from books and stuff rather than trying to hand draw them on the board. But we'll come back uh, and hand draw them. Uh, on the board to to show you what what when we're in the practice of solving problems and thinking about things in terms of the atomic orbitals we want to be able to quickly draw these on the board okay so let's look at the dot cam over here and what we have here is uh, the direct solutions now squared so um, hard to see in red here but uh, this is our wave function squared actually mod squared uh, but uh, again think of that as squared and we see the familiar what we're familiar with already this is the 1s okay so n is 1 l is 0 and uh, M is zero, so that's an S type, and we see the surface of a sphere representing the range over which most of the uh, electron, if you were to make a measurement of the position of the electron, most of the time it would be found inside that sphere, and a small amount of time it would be found outside that sphere. Now let's move on to N equals two. So uh, with n equals 2 and l equals 2, so we're not going to see all of them here because, of course, when n equals 2, 
we also could have L equals zero. That's just going to be a bigger sphere with another sphere inside it. So just like we drew, we just drew on the board. So let's look at the P types now. So with the P type, we're going to get, when we square this, we're going to get a, what we call a dumbbell shape. And so a lobe up top, a lobe below, and there's a nodal plane uh, right through here. So if you imagine um, the, we would label this as plus and this as minus. Then when it gets squared, the, what we're looking at here is the square. So when it gets squared, it looks the same. Now the n equals two, m equals one or minus one, they're different functions. They're complex functions, but when you square them, they look the same. When you mod square them, they look the same. And they look like this donut here, or this bead with a hole. So we've got the dumbbell case here, and then two of these donuts. So there's a total of three p orbitals, as we know from last time. And uh, they would be the p, we would call these the 2p0, 2p1, 2p minus 1. Uh, let's look further. So 3, now of course 3 could have a S, that would just be 3 concentric spheres. 3 could have a P, that would be 2 concentric, say, dumbbells, or 2 concentric donuts, so a donut inside a donut. And they would alternate signs there at, at a node. Uh, so we're going to focus here on the new looking ones, and uh, these are the D types, that's when L equals 2, L equals 2, and um, let's go through the M values. So when M is 0, we get what we tend to call a dumbbell with a hula hoop around it. So this dumbbell with a hula hoop uh, structure. Uh, at the wave function level, this would be plus, the hula hoop is minus, and the other one is plus, or of course, we have a complete freedom to go minus plus minus as well. So once it's squared, in both cases would look like this. Now let's look at the m equals one or minus one. We have these stacked donuts. So we sort of have this P shape, but with the donut structures. So we can kind of see this structure here. And then uh, finally with the plus or minus two, we'd have a donut structure again. So there's one of these, there's two of these, one for each of the plus and the minus, and then one of, and two of these, one for each of the plus and the minus. And we can keep going. Um, so Fs will look like this. And notice this kind of structure here. We just add an extra hula hoop. This, this sort of angles over, and now we have a dumbbell with a hula hoop, but with the donuts. And then the pie, uh, sort of like the dumbbell with the donuts, and finally the dumbbell. So there's a pattern here of these structures um, that you can that that you can see, and this just kind of continues as we go further and further uh, up in the uh, L value here. All right. Well, that's the physicist's picture. So what do we do here? Well, let's stick with the P's. Uh, and then let's look at let's look at what we do with the P's. So, all right, we have three P orbitals, uh, and these are the three so three P orbitals, and these are um, the three P zero, three P one, three P mi minus one. Now, this is what we call the physicist's picture, so the physics picture. And what we're going to do here is we're going to convert to the chemist's picture. And let's see how that happens. So to go to the chemist's picture, the 3D, or the 3P0 just comes straight over, and it is 3P0, but we're not going to write 0, we're going to write Z. So 3 P Z instead, and that just represents that. That's the same as three three Z uh, three P zero. Now these two come over to form two orbitals: three P X and three P Y. 
Now, how do they form that? And so this gives the chemist picture. How do they form that? Well, the 3px equals 3p1 plus 3p minus 1. And the 3py equals 3p1 minus 3p1. And so we call this a linear combination. Uh, the, the positive linear combination here is the px, and the, pos and the negative linear combination is the py. So these are linear combinations. Now, notice what happens, though. We cannot associate a single m with x or y. Instead, we have to say plus n minus m equals plus m mi n minus 1. So this intermixes the plus and the minus 1 here. So that's the disadvantage of the chem picture. And um, in many cases, the Gen Chem books will just sort of stop talking about M. Uh, what's happened is that we can no longer associate an M. So it'll be introduced, and then uh, we don't really use it once we talk about uh, PX, PY, PZ, or the chemist picture. Uh, instead, we just need to, at least at the Gen Chem level, memorize these. We're going to see in the next video a way to go a little bit beyond uh, memorizing these. All right, well, let's go to the Ds. And just as any, uh, you know, a, as anyone comes out of general chemistry, uh, it's key to know all of the atomic orbitals up through the Ds. Uh, and so that's definitely something that you'll want to practice on at the very least. Uh, again, next time we will talk about a way to um, generalize that so that you can go beyond the Ds. But we're going to talk about uh, S's, P's, and D's uh, in today's lecture. So let's look at these Ds. So we have a D0, we have a 3D1, 3D minus 1, and then we have a 3D2 and a 3D minus 2. Again, the physics picture over here. Now this comes straight over to 3DZ squared, as it's called. These combine to 3DX and 3 D, uh, sorry, 3DXZ, 3DX, uh, sorry, YZ. So the Zs are there, and then it's X and Y. Okay, that's what the ones give us. And this is the positive combination. And this is the negative combination. These give. the 3dxy and the 3dx squared minus y squared. And these are the 3d2 plus 3d minus 2, 3d2 minus 3d minus 2. This is the chemist picture. So again, we still have five orbitals. The 3dz squared, the 3dxz, the 3dyz, the 3dxy, and the 3dx squared minus y squared. Now, in some of the older literature, and maybe in your chem book, this could be an x squared plus y squared. Um, so that's just um, a different notation. It's still the same, same orbital. All right, well, what do these combinations look like? Well, let's, let's look at them sort of in 3D space here. So I'm going to put down a coordinate system, and we'll walk through these different orbitals. So the first one we'll start with is the 1s. And the 1s here just looks like a sphere. So we'll set that right at the origin of the coordinate system. And um, so we can imagine just a sphere uh, and all positive throughout. Now the 2s, the 2s here is just a bigger sphere. 
So you can imagine if we could cut this sphere open, a little sphere would be inside and there'd be a node, just like we drew on the board. And we'd have concentric spheres. All right, let's look at the P's now. So uh, the P's are uh, the P, the PX, or the, sorry, the PY will look like this. And we're going to use, we're going to use, uh, say, positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, whatever you want, purple and, and pink. And they're going to represent the different signs. So there's a nodal plane right here that separates the purple and the pink. And this is going to be oriented straight up at us, just like that. So coming straight up in the z-axis. Then, so that's the pz. The px is going to look just like this. So there's the px. So again, this dumbbell structure, nodal plane right here now. So a nodal plane right there. With the, with the pz, the nodal plane was right here. Okay, and then finally, we have a py. And that's oriented in this direction. So together, right, we have all three of them. They're all on top of each other. They're, the nucleus is right here. This white is the nucleus. And so that's what the set of chemist picture orbitals look like. Px, Py, Pz. Now the Ds, the Dz squared, um, we said that looks just like the Dz0 from the physics picture. So that's the dumbbell with the hula hoop. So pink purple, pink, mm -hmm. and that's again oriented straight up at us. So we put that straight up at us in that direction. Right? The nucleus sits right here, right at the center, right at the center of this hula hoop. Now the ones, these linear combinations involving the X's and the Y's, the DZ the dzx is the xz plane, so that's this orientation. And then the dy right, is the dyz is this orientation. So we have uh, these two orthogonal clover leaves, as we tend to call them, clover leaves. Um, again, all on top of each other. So the white is. The white is representing the nucleus right at the center, and they're just rotated 90 degrees to one another. Then the combination involving the m equals plus or minus 2 are like this. So here is the here is the um, p the 3dxy. The lobes go off in this direction kind of 45 degrees with the axes and then rotated 45 degrees is the x squared minus y squared. So these are the 3D orbitals in three-dimensional space. Okay. Now when we go up in an n value for any of these shapes, whether it's a, a P shape or a D shape, the shape remains the same, and we just get, so the shape remains the same, we just get a larger structure. So we have a concentric, we have uh, concentric P, P's here, so a P inside of a P. Okay, well, let's just look at a couple of more pictures uh, of this. So here's sort of a 3D sketch on a 2D sheet of paper, uh, and let's see if we can zoom in a little. Here, going up this very, here's the 1s, 2s, 3s, so uh, an increasing size sphere, and then it's spheres within a sphere. Here's the two Ps, uh, Px, Py, Pz, and then we go up in size. And we get just dumbbells oriented, just larger dumbbells oriented in these different directions. And then finally the Ds right here. 
And uh, again, if we go up in size, we would get concentric uh, Ds. Uh, the, these shapes would be concentric. Okay, I'm going to go back to the whiteboard and we'll talk about how to draw these just quickly on paper. And that's what we'll be doing most of the time. I'm going to go back to the whiteboard here. So just for good practice, let's work through all of these very quickly. So the one S, we would draw like that. Two S, we would draw like that. And again, you're free to choose what you call plus and minus, but once you call this plus, this has to be minus. If you call this minus, this has to be plus. 3s, now we have two nodes like this. Uh, let's do the 2pz. Two P X, so kind of draw it off at this angle. That's the X. Let's say the X direction is this way, Z direction is this way, and the Y direction is in the board. So there's our coordinate system. So this is the two P X, and then the two P Z or two P Y. would look something like that. The threes. Something like that, so concentric dumbbells. I'll just draw the one there. These would be concentric as well. 3dz squared. draw something like that, plus, minus, plus. So the hula hoop is the minus. Both lobes of the dumbbell are plus. Then what we usually do is uh, instead of trying to draw a 3D coordinate system, we project out into a ZX and we draw our clover leaf just like that. So this would be the 3DXZ, and this would be the 3DYZ. And then we project into the XY plane. for the, uh, the, those orbitals that are rising for the m equals 2 case, plus or minus 2. And we get something that looks like that. So this is the 3dxy, and this is the 3dx squared plus minus y squared. And next time, we'll learn why we call these these. Why do we use these subscripts? And uh, we'll talk a lot more about nodes, uh, and they're going to be very important. So uh, again, nodes here. There's a node as we go, as we swing around from here to here. Uh, so there's a nodal plane right here. There's a node right here as we cross from plus to minus, but the outer lines, the outer lines are not nodes. So we have to be very careful with that subtlety. So <clears throat> node here, <clears throat> node here, none there. All right, for now, I think what you wanna do is just see if you can get these pictures down. So can you draw these 
draw everything up through the three Ds. So 1S, 2S, 3S, 2P, 3P, and 3D. So if you can start to draw all of those and uh, get to the point where if you say 3DX or 3DXY, you can draw it right away. Or if you see the picture of 3DXY, you can label it right away. So spend the next bit of time just trying to get these down. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next lecture in something called node analysis, where we'll look very carefully at these nodes and what they can tell us about the wave functions and how they can generalize so we don't have to just memorize what these are. We can use the node analysis to draw the pictures themselves.